Excuse me? Hello, hello, and welcome back to Friend Sam. Uh, the music stopped playing for a second, but it's okay. We're moving on to volume 13. No, 14. We're on 14 now, which is kind of weird because it looks like we have um, a rust blood for the first time since Diamond. And it looks like we got a violet blood who is black and white like a mime. Is this the fan troll that got inserted into this? I know that there was like one troll that's a fan troll that got inserted into this. Because there was a contest that went on. But whatever. Chapter Volume 14 of Cleanliness and Cleanliness. This is a dark world. Both because it's night and because the brutal struggle of for survival amongst its polyhemochromatic inhabitants, many of whom seem to thrive on havoc and carnage. You'd be interested to see the, <laughs> the Michelin Guide entry for Alternia. You're convinced that after a day here, Anne Rand would sign up with, a little sis with the Little Sisters of the Poor, Genghis Khan and Attila the Hun would join the Quakers, and Adolf Hitler would seek a membership in the World Peace Council. <laughs> Whew. Godwin's Law Alert. Feeling a little dramatic tonight. Okay. Yeah. He's, so, he's a small high blood. Look how small this high blood is. He's small. So small. But I think, but of course we're gonna go from left to right. Can't tell if it's a guy or a girl or if it goes by they. Okay. Marsty Hotek. Marsty. Sounds like a girl's name, but it could be a guy. I don't know. There we go. Do 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 do. Okay. Not too loud, I hope. Sounds a smidge loud. Maybe it might just be my end. I'll turn it down just a little bit more. Okay. <clears throat> Despite a certain sense of pervading existential gloom that you haven't managed to shake even after communing with the possible oracle secret agent, you're feeling pretty alright. No more brooding in your cliffside apartment. You have a fresh thirst this evening. A thirst for friendship. You've been wandering around a neighborhood you haven't seen in a while, just a few blocks from where you crash-landed. Maybe you'll go pay a visit to the crash site of your ship, even though it's long since been stripped for parts by the local population. Or maybe you'll try to find Diamond and say hi, though you're probably sure he's still living in the nomadic shrubbery lifestyle. You're just here for the nostalgia, honestly. Malaise who? You hardly know her. Just then, from across the street, Echo, two voices raised an argument. Ooh. Well, one is soft and murmuring, and one is loud and honking. A rust-blood girl and a purple-blood guy are squared off in front of a patch of graffiti that blooms over the bricks like moss. So soft, murmuring, rust-blood girl. <clears throat> okay. The girl appears to be in the process of scrubbing it away, there's a mop bucket and a collection of sponges next to her. And I told you, this stuff is sacred mother trucking iconography, the purple blood is saying. So screw the hell off, little red dumpling. The rust blood says something back that makes him laugh. The sacred iconography appears to be a collection of swear words and a couple colorful renderings of certain sections of troll anatomy. You have not yet had the chance to explore. The girl with the bucket wrings her sponge out and stares the clown down. While you assume she's staring him down, she's wearing big round goggles to match the bright rubber gloves, pulled all the way up to her elbows. Despite the mop bucket, she looks more like a scientist from a B-grade horror movie than a janitor. The purple blood doesn't have any visible weapons on him, but that doesn't make him look any less dangerous. And unless the girl has a blade in that mop handle, she's totally defenseless. You've faced this precise scenario more than once, but it doesn't get any easier. No matter how much self-confidence you've earned or hardships you endure, life-or-death friendship decisions don't get any easier. 
intervene or mind your own business for once in your life. Let's try intervening, because I just want to see the world burn. Who are you kidding? You were never going to leave her to fend for herself. It's against your religion. Your religion of flexivity and ceaselessly searching for new buddies. You aren't making excuses for it anymore. You decide to take what Boldier said to heart and just resign yourself to fate. Well, th that isn't exactly what she said, but a lot of it was confusing and spooky. You're half convinced she was just doing it for the mysterious aesthetic. You stride confidently towards the altercation, calling out a challenge to the rogue clown. Nobody messes with those less fortunate while you are on the case. Mmm. And it's since and since it's been resoundingly too long since you've had a truly ironic and hilarious twist of fate befall you, as soon as you step up onto the sidewalk, the purple blood's fist connects with your head, and your head connects with the concrete. That was fast. That fist doesn't even look that big. But that expression... My god. Anyway. Hopefully I can... Okay. Mind your own business for once in your life. Listen, you aren't the problem alien special forces. You aren't the friendship police. You can't afford to insert yourself into the middle of every single altercation in hopes that the drunken gamble of destiny will offer up new and greater connections to your sore, tired butt. You aren't made of goodwill alone. Everyone needs breaks, man. You march casually by, hands behind your back. If you knew how to whistle, you would. Nothing to see here, folks. Feet smack the ground behind you and the girl runs by, surprisingly spry in rubber boots. Not spry enough, apparently, because the high blood is hot on her heels. Nope, not helping. Definitely not. Don't get involved. Don't get involved. You already made your choice. You're not getting involved. At the last moment, you stick out one of your famous legs and the clown goes flying. He hits the pavement hard, nose first. Son of a gun, there you went and got involved. The high blood might be kissing concrete, but he won't be for very long. It's tough to kill a clown. Can't kill the clown, man. Can't kill the clown. You take this opportunity to GTFO. Man, you don't know anybody around here. Maybe you can run back to your stolen vehicle before... Oop, we in, we in here we are. Back again. Hands grab you by the back of the hoodie, hauling you around the corner and into the shadows of an alleyway. Man, the clown must have friends, and those friends have circled around behind you. Opening your mouth to, to, you open your mouth to scream. Not because you think anyone's going to help you, but just because you might as well. If you can't go out fighting, might as well go out making as much noise and being as obnoxious as possible. A rubber-gloved hand slaps you up in the mouth before you get a chant, get one more than a, get a more out more than a squeak. I can read. You taste soap. Okay, so she's like a low-key kind of voice. Okay, I can do that. Interesting horns she's got. Okay. <clears throat> Chill. Stop struggling. It's the Rust Blood girl. She's taken the time to... She's taken the time you'd bought her and ca cashed it in to take refuge in an alleyway. The two of you hold still as the Purple Blood storms by, stomping and cursing and bleeding from a gash across his forehead. Ha! Huh? You did that. Your leg did that. You'll never get over the rush you receive from doing something cool and incomp incompetent. Marsty holds you until the sound of his footsteps fade. You feel her heartbeat hammering against your back. She lets you go and slides away to the other side of the alley, as if an apology for being too close to you before. Her boots squeak. You take a few steps nearer so you don't have to shout to be heard. To You thank her for helping. Y you're both just all about helping, apparently. You decide not to mention the part where you tried very hard not to get involved. Yeah. You didn't have to do that. Actually, you shouldn't have. I'm perfectly capable of tripping my own clowns. You tell her you had no doubt it's true, even if she doesn't have a sword in her mop handle. She seems to have a good pair of legs. Oh, she gone. Mentioning her mop appears to remind her that she left that all her cleaning equipment out on the street. She takes a furtive glance across the way, down the way the guy had gone, then heads back towards the graffiti. You scamper to keep up. You shouldn't be out in a place like this. Not that I can really summon much gumption to care beyond this one walk down the street. But you did come here to die. Because that's what's going to happen if you keep this up. What's your deal? 
You don't know how- you don't know about your deal. You've worked really hard not to consider your deal at all. Because the existential radio static that prickles at the base of your neck when you think about your deal is astonishingly unpleasant. Attempting to change the subject, you ask her if maybe she shouldn't get out of here while she has the chance. Is that bucket really that important to her? Marcy looks at you with a certain eyebrow raise that you're well accustomed to by now. Oh crap, you just put your foot in it again, culture-wise. Cause you said bucket, quit saying bucket! You wish you could find a book on a crash course in Alternia, or at least in a, a decent Wikipedia article, but it's not like there's any helpful Earth Guide for Idiots. At least you've never heard one. Besides, things are different depending on where you are on Earth, geographically. You imagine it's the same for Alternia. Doubt it. You're feeling positively nauseated at the idea of having to learn a whole new set of social norms. You'll just stay in this particular city, thank you very much. Do you care? Do I care about my bucket? That's kind of a weird way to phrase it. I care about it as much as the next person who doesn't want to get called. Also, scoured rays don't grow on coniferous fauna. She tosses her discarded sponge back to the bucket. You bend down to help, but she stops you with a sardonic glance. Most of her glances are sardonic, but this one is especially so. She goes back to work on the graffiti. If you're going to hang around, you could make yourself less useless. Watch and make sure that high blood doesn't come back. Oh yeah, for sure. You can do totally do that. Of course, you won't be able to actually do anything if he comes back. Where's Remelay when you need her? Maybe she could use her own limp corpse to slow the clown down. Maybe you could own... Okay, maybe you could use your own limp cor corpse to slow the clown down. Not that you know Marcy well enough to yet to love the idea of sacrificing yourself for her. Man, character development's great. Not immediately going to your death is great. Though that sends a creeping wash of anxiety across your spine. You don't understand it, but you try to distract yourself. You ask Marcy... Marsty. If she's just cleans graffiti, or if she has other jobs. Okay, well maybe not jobs. You know everybody on Alternia. You don't know anybody on Alternia has an actual job. Whatever I'm feeling, mostly. Today I was feeling getting rid of this incredibly ugly piece of drawing. Tomorrow I might be feeling dirty. Might be feeling dirty front door mats. Depends on my mood. Yeah, you def get that. You're also a person in of mercurial moods. You seek out new friends tonight. Will you do you seek out new friends tonight or go on one of your sta Okay, I can read. You do seek out No, do you seek out new friends tonight or do you go on one of your standby pals? Sometimes the universe just sweeps in and decides for you. <laughs> Mercury. Okay. Yeah, well, you are extremely weird and focused on weird stuff. But also kind of magnetic at the same time. It's freaking me out. Wow, thank you. Marty dunks her sponge back in the bucket. Or scoured ray. Right, buckets are dirty. <laughs> Drums don't make it down here very often. There's a lot of stuff to scrub. You tell her it's cool that she likes cleaning so much. Where you're from... Physical labor is considered morally virtuous, but also kind of looked down on? Man, maybe you could use an Earth cultural handbook of your own self. Who said anything about liking it? Who made the rule that I can only do what I like? Ooh, girl. She is so contrary to everything you say. She slams the sponge down hard onto the scour dray, settling wa getting water down the front of her apron. This is just what I do. What do you- what, do you like wandering around in someone else's hoodie? Accosting strangers? Kind of. Sometimes. You didn't choose the friend life. The friend life chose you. But Marty isn't the, a stranger in a strange world like you are. She's got horns and gray skin and everything. You realize she's a rusty, but come on. Oh yeah. How many burgundies do you know exactly? Uh, well, one. And he's interested in a- in a meat. But he's pretty enthusiastic about it. One might say, over-enthusiastic. You think I'm not enthusiastic? She scrubs harder to show that just how enthusiastic she can be. A delicate calligraphy, based rendering the word globe gobbler 
disappears beneath her soapy hands. Okay, maybe Diamond is not the greatest example of someone enjoying their hobbies in a healthy and natural way. But you know plenty of other low bloods with cool hobbies. Skyla, Chixie, Sarava. Am I supposed to know who these idiots are? Not all low bloods know each other. And she prickly. Oh man, that's not what you meant at all. I'm not gonna explain my life story to you to some random alien. Are you gonna help or not? Oh, you thought you were supposed to be keeping an eye out for clowns. Yeah, well, instead you're asking me invasive questions? So help me scrub. Despite these mixed signals, you pick up a sponge and start cleaning. This is actually a lot harder work than it looks like, and your back and shoulders begin to ache immediately. If Martsty does this every day, she must be ripped under that jacket. She stops talking and you just clean alongside her, worried that you're royally screwing this up. You don't know how to fix it. The graffiti is quickly disappearing between your combined efforts, and you aren't sure how much longer she's going to put up with you after that. You've got to pull out the big friendship guns and fast. You ask, in your characteristically smooth style, what's she doing after this? Any plans? Just hypothetically. Who knows? Probably I'll just look for more stuff to clean. Hmm, well, just so happens you know a lot of dirty places. Just exceptionally filthy. Oh, yeah? Where? Uptown, downtown. Well, I'm terrified to bring her uptown. Funk you up. Uptown, funk you up. So, let's try downtown. Because downtown San Francisco, we ain't talking about that place. I am never... The day I walk back into downtown San Francisco, it will be a day too soon. Anyway, downtown, let's go. You suggest that this place sure looks ripe for some serious power cleaning. Because, wow, filthy. Yeah, I guess. I was planning on cleaning down here anyway. The drones mostly take care of the high blood neighborhoods. Interesting. Zebros had low bloods cleaning for him, but maybe he's an exception. I'm not here to explain cultural dynamics to you. Are you what are you good for, then? <laughs> At least not for free. You consider mentioning that you are the main character and thus totally deserving of cultural exposition, but you doubt she'd take that well. Also, it's kind of a weird thing to say, so never mind that. You show Martsy an alley you recognize. The one with the incinerator where Palapa had gotten rid of her assassination disguise. Here, maybe? Too easy. Okay, well, how about the stretch of road where Remelay killed a dude? There's still quite a bit of purple blood spattered around. Pretty good. But no. I don't have the right outfit for blood. Jeez, picky. Oh, sorry. Are my personal preferences inconveniencing you? No, but you aren't used to this being taken so long to pop off. Usually you've made a friend by this point, or you've been killed. You've been killed before? Don't bring up the weird plot devices in here. We already had enough of that with the little, like, uh, gremlin, uh, green blood. What are you, a per-beast? <laughs> yeah, because we got nine lives, son. Nine lives. In retrospect, that also is a pretty weird thing to say. You meant it as a metaphor. Sometimes your eternal monologue gets out of hand and spills out into your inter interlocution. Whatever, dude. You're considering just bringing her back to your place to clean up the mess you've made there when you realize Marcy is no longer with you. You turn around to find her gazing down an adjacent street to an empty lot. The space gives you a brief twinge of recognition before it fizzles away to nothing. Meh, probably just deja vu. Oh gosh, it, it, it's the alleyway. Oh man, please be something weird. Yes, it is. At first, you don't... You don't notice the person sitting on the tire pile because without her other half, her silhouette is over is underwhelming. Wait. Follicle? Follicle! Hey, girl! Up! Okay. Oh, fantastic. Hey, Normie. Oops, what happened? Okay, there we go. I clicked away from the window for a second. That was scary. Oh, hi, Follicle! It's been a while. She might notice that you are a whole lot less normal than you used to be. 
They're right. They're weird as hell. Hey, you're also like 80% more confident than you used to be. You don't back down from insults. Perhaps Marcy is the one who's weird because she's the one who's messing with cleaning up after people. That's really strange. Hey, that's a little judgy. Yeah, for real. Oh, uh, you've been expecting Follicle to join you in the mocking, Marcy. You didn't want, her to want to be too mean or anything. You just really are sick of having your intelligence insulted concerning stuff you absolutely could have no way of knowing about. You want to make her look like an idiot, but as usual, it seems, in fact, you are the idiot. Marcy seems to agree. Hey, maybe go screw yourself a little bit? You apologize. You didn't mean it. You just... You just experience pilot confusion when there's too many friends in one place. You're sorry. You didn't mean to insult her hobby, but she real but she actually doesn't really seem too into it. You're just trying to help her. You know plenty of low bloods of all sorts of activities. Am I speaking loud enough? Okay, I'm just making sure. Okay, back to this. Okay. Oh uh, yeah. Who? Well, Follicle, for instance. She trolls- wait, you need another word. She and her boyfriend, uh, harass people. And they seem to enjoy that. Also, there's Skyla and Chixie and Sarava. They all excel in their fields. To a certain extent. Right. So how's that going for them? Well... You deflate somewhat. Chixie gets skeeved on all- gets skeeved on all the time, and Skyla constantly has to defend her home and Lucis against thieves. Sarava literally has to gouge out their own eye and downplay their psychic power. Vicare, well, near you, uh, near you can tell, Vicare is having a great time falling off cliffs and imagining the affirmative above. He might be an outlier and therefore should not be counted. Is he still jumping off of cliffs? I thought he broke every bone in his little body. Anyway... While you're working on your apparent classism through navel-gazing monologue, Marcy is checking Follicle out. Like, really checking her out. Who the f- Okay. Who the hell are you? Follicle slaps Marcy's hand away. Keep your fronds to yourself. Whoa, we see her eyes. Marcy raises her goggles up to her forehead. You got void rot. No crap, troll Sherlock. <laughs> They've heard of Sherlock, though. Marcy gives her another once over. She looks impressed. You honestly can't blame her. If Marcy looks like if Marcy likes grimy things, well, Follicle is right up her alley. Dirt El Dorado. Selfishly, you wish you met Marcy back when you were more of a wreck at the beginning of your adventure. You're filthy. Oh no, she likes things dirty. And you have no idea what you're talking about. Also, screw you. Marcy touches her on the forehead, slowly this time, so as not to take her by surprise. Follicle resembles a nervous little bug trying to decide whether or not to scuttle away. Is this, is this a black rom thing? This is getting weird. Do you think the dirt helped kept keep you insulated it's actually the opposite of that if you were less grimy the energy transfer would be easier all right kuprum is in here which means her giant battery isn't here either yeah i sent him out for takeout needed a a break but won't she you know die not instantly I like the eye roll on this one. Does your hus top die as soon as you unplug it? What are you... Uh, what are you, a void rot scholar? What do you know? I know a lot of things. You ask Marcy if she's interested in medicine. Maybe she could get into that. Marcy rounds on you in stark irritation. This is the most emotion she's shown you since you've met her. Whatever you're trying to do here, stop. I'm not stupid. What do you think they'll say if I apply to be a medic off-planet? They'd laugh their butts off and hand me a saturated scrub... saturated scrub pole. 
that's if they're feeling generous. This is what I do. So let me do it. Ooh. Chastened and uncharacteristically speechless, you nod and let Marcy turn back to Follicle. You really don't want to just leave it like that, but maybe the truly friendly thing here to do would be less would be less trying to improve your friend's life and just letting them live it. Diamond told you the much the same thing all those months ago. He's trying to he's planning to just keep his head down and trying to stay alive. It's not uplifting, but maybe not everything has to be. Marcy gives Follicle some advice as to best way to make sure her body retains as much energy as possible. Follicle groans, and you're pretty sure that if she had eyes, she'd be rolling them. You do notice, however, that she listens. Marcy starts back down the sidewalk after that, pushing her scour dray in front of her. After a moment's hesitation, you follow, half expecting for her to get mad again. Instead, she just slows down so you can catch up. She's pulled her goggles back down over her eyes. You think they're probably more there for social reasons than protective ones. Sheepishly. Oh, that's, that's funny, because they're kind of like sheep eyes. Okay, I get it. You apologize for being a busybody back there. You're just really used to wanting to help people out. Kind of for selfish reasons, friendship reasons, but still. Yeah. It's fine. No hard feelings. You just like fixing things when they're busted. Or when you've busted them through your own chronic idiocy. Sometimes you just gotta do what you can. But you think Marcy might understand that a bit. Yeah. I think I might. Sometimes it be like that. Yeah! Woo! Sometimes it be like that. Okay. <laughs> Let's check out the friendships. Okay, we, we got that. Now we just got one more to go. And it looks like... I haven't played it. I'm just reminding you. Have not played... The ones, like, here, here, and here, they're just sh they just show up for whatever reason. That's just what it is. This is my life now. Anyway, I guess they're going to some sort of circus. Anyway, back into the fray. Scrolly, scrolly, scrolling. Let's go find this small boy clown. This is a dark world. Survival, city guide, maybe... He's so monochromatic. Including his horns. What's up with that? Anyway. Uh, I like the last name, though. Okay, so we got uh, Caraco Perot. Caraco Perot. Okay. I like the rhyming scheme. Is cool. And why do all the high bloods seem to have fangs that are like the color of horns? It's kind of spooky. Anyway, let's go. Having learned the dangers of using the public thoroughfares, you've taken to dodging down byways and skulking near in rear areas, trying to spy out individuals who look right for friendship while avoiding the more criminally insane denizens. Just now you're following a winding footpath through the undergrowth surrounding a neighborhood where the local hives are spaced far apart. Hmm. You came creeping along this footpath for safety. You should have known better. The undergrowth here is like most of the other life forms on Alternia, evolved to ruthlessly purge the gene pool of the weak and the reasonable. Coiled, spring-loaded stalks with foot-long thorns flank writhing bushes with razor-edged leaves, which in turn crowd tentacle flora with tooth lobes oozing liquid that hisses and smokes when it touches the ground. Extreme caution is needed, just as it's needed in every circumstance on this planet. While your time on Alternia has gotten you accustomed to injuries, you still shrink from being impaled on sprung thorns and dissolved in acid. You should have known that eventually you would have to come up against the local flora, so you proceed discreetly, avoiding poison fronds and trying not to step on trigger roots. But suddenly your vegetative focus is interrupted, you hear footsteps on the path, and then around the corner comes a small figure. Man, this is kind of loud. Now, is this the Toby Fox clown song? I'll have to look into this. I don't know. It sounds James Roach still. So, who knows? Anyway. 
Its face and horns are painted with smudge black and white ma marks. Despite its diminutive physique, it has some of the most impressive horns you've seen on any troll. Whoa. Then the small figure sees you too and is so startled it jumps a foot, impaling its horns into an overhanging tree branch and sticking there so that its small legs pump helplessly in the air. Honk! You beg the small person's pardon and assure him that you're fully as startled as he. You go on to explain that you're not dangerous, but even if you were, you would not want to come to strife even with a small person with horns of that size. Honk? Yes. You will be happy to help him down, as he as as he promises not to attack you. As long as he promises not to attack you with the many bladed weapons that are stuffed into his belt, or with the dozen cans of inexpensive soft drink held in the bandoliers across his chest. It strikes you suddenly that a neighborly gesture, like helping someone whose horns are stuck in a tree branch, can scarcely fail to kindle the light of friendship. You dare to hope that this will be the case now. Edging forward, you get close enough to see that around the small clown's neck hangs a dog tag or an ID necklace. You tilt your head and crane your neck to read the writing on it. Kark, let's see, Karako Perot. If lost, call Branya Ursama. Oh, you're a young troll from the caverns, huh? Why do you have so many knives? Suddenly this all makes sense. This Karako Perot must have been one of Branya's recent... No, reject runt wrigglers, who have now, having grown to childhood under her tender care, has gone out into the world to seek his fortune. That would account for his small size, short legs, and small stature relative to his horns. You eagerly pull out your palm husk, happy for an excuse to pester an old friend, but you've got zero signal out here. You wonder if the surrounding vegetation eats palm husk signals, just as it looks like it eats everything else. You disappointedly slip your palm husk back into your pocket. You apologize for the delay, explaining that you were surprised to find that you appear to have an acquaintance in common, for whom you hope you'll have a time to discuss later. For now, you're willing and ready and hopeful to help him down. First, you hope he won't be offended if you slip behind him first. It's not that you object to bladed weapons or those who stuff dozens of them in their belts, but you feel like the ones he's wearing could ruin your look if you buried them in your torso, however unintentionally. You edge past the weapons, being careful so to not touch the spring thorns growing near the edge of the path, or their trigger roots. Here we go. He's so cute. Once you're f behind Karako, you grasp his horns firmly and pull, pulling him them from the tree branch and allowing him to drop lightly to the ground. Honk! You tell him that he's very welcome. Then there's an awkward silence as you try to think of something else to say. And for, let's see, fortunately, your new potential friend is not as devoid of social graces as you and gets to the conversation ball rolling himself. Honk? You explain that you are indeed a stranger in these parts and that you don't actually fit into any of the hemospectrum categories. Wild, right? Although not quite as strange as it used to be, you like to think you're really starting to blend in the local color. Honk? Um, well, you'd rather not exhibit your blood just now. You're a couple of quarts low due to the robust conditions of life on Alternia, some of which you recently had the honor of encountering. Honk. You sympathize. Slinking along these paths in Alternian woods must be tough on the morale. The, lo the smell alone is enough to make a strong man weep, and the vegetation looks like it was designed by the Marquis de Sade. Not that he knows who the Marquis de Sade is. You can't help but feel that it would be so much better if only you had a sulk, buddy, you continue. How wonderful it would be to travel these dusky lanes with a kindred spirit. A twin soul, a fellow traveler. Ha 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 an intimate crony. You're such an expert on friend synonyms by now. Honk? No, you haven't met anyone like that either, but you would certainly like to. Your new potential friend is obviously thinking seriously about this issue. So you back off, give him some space... You pretend to be deeply immersed in studying one of the razor-sharp leaves on one of the writhing bushes beside the path. You aren't one to force yourself on others, or try to unduly influence their friendship decisions. Okay, well, maybe you forced yourself on others in the past, and tried to influence their friendship decisions. But you've done this a lot. No, maybe you've done this a lot, but you've recently evolved as a person. You know, now that friendship is something that has to come authentically from within. Friendship is spontaneous. Real friendship sprouts naturally from the soil of mutual respect. 
The best friendships grow and ripen over the years and are not rushed or forced. Of course, you've only known this small person for about five minutes, but you're starting to ripen. But you have to start ripening sometime. You're reflecting thus on the same on the theme of friendship when a loud pours suddenly from the sky above you. It's a crackling, sizzling sound like a chitinous thing with too many legs struggling in a frying pan. Karako jumps so violently that he nearly hits his, gets his horn stuck in the tree again. Looking up, you see a floating metal object, vaguely troll-shaped, but huge faceless metal and with numerous sets of lightning bolt-shaped horns coming off its head and neck. Wait, is this a, a, a psionic? It's also not a very sparkling conversationalist. Shrishishiro, it remarks in a flat, echoing blare. Uh, Skrishishishiro, it elaborates further. Honk! Run a drone or leap into your proto friend's aid. Uh, let's just go up to his aid. You leap onto your proto friend's. You leap to your proto friend's aid. Thinking quickly, you push Karako against a large rock that juts out in front of the undergrowth nearby and jump in front of him, shielding him from the drone with your body. Then you pretend to. Oh, what was that? I'm sorry. Then you pretend to be leaning against the rock in an attitude of tranquil repose. Several of the bladed weapons in Karako's belt poke you in the butt, but you don't let this show on your face. Instead, you yawn elaboratively and check your wristwatch. You don't have a wristwatch, but you don't think drones know what a wristwatch is anyway. You pretend to smoke a non-existing cigarette. Again, you're not giving anything away because drones don't know what cigarettes are either. But the drone has apparently taken an interest in you. It floats down from the trees and undergrowth and hovers above the path several meters from where you're pretending just to relax against the rock after a long day of hiking through the scenic, crap-smelling forest. It's quite a terrifying sight, actually. Skrishajil, the drone, observes soullessly, making Karako jump so that several of your internal organs have threat are threatened. However, you maintain what you believe is the local populace would call a stiff upper whistle pillow. The drone's blank metal head studies you, or could be studying something in the opposite direction, or even talk, taking the drone equivalent of a, of a pee break. Can't really tell from its expression because it has no features with, ma with no features to make expressions with. This examination or non-examination continues for some time. But your diminutive potential friend is well hidden from view, and after a while, evidently concluding that you are an inanimate object that makes un unaccountable gestures with its wrist and fingers, the drone floats upward again, gaining speed, until, with a dreary skirishishil, it whizzes off somewhere to find another hapless non-standard citizen to euthanize. When it's gone, you stand away from the rock and rub several sore places where you've been pierced by bladed weapons. You return to Karako to comment on their recent fervor, but stop when you see the look he's directing at you. A warm and admiring look, an affectionate and esteeming look, a look of friendship. Your first impulse is to throw your arms around him and lean in, but on second thought, remembering his pants arsenal, you put on one hand for a warm handshake. Victory is so close. But before you can seal the deal on this sweet friendship, friendship transaction, you hear a disturbance further down the path. Uh, can't the narrative chill for one single moment? Especially a moment when you're about to consummate a beautiful friendship? You get a look, the footsteps, several sets of them get nearer, and around the bend come three figures. Three figures wearing swimming outfits, lots of gold jewelry, and insoc... Insociant expressions? Three figures with grills on their necks and small stylized fins on their face. <gasps> sea dwellers! Holy crap. Oh man, is it possible you finally happened to group upon a group of legendary sea dwellers? They obviously they stopped short when they see you in Karako. Obviously startled. They study you. You study them. The f then fin headed interloper one in a one piece and diamond earrings whispers to her companions, and all three of them burst out laughing. Fin head interloper two, a violet wetsuit in a let's see, in a violet wetsuit and rings, slaps her thigh and fin-headed interloper number three in checkered swimming trunks trunks holds his sides. Part of you is relieved. Laughter dri drives out the devil, is the best medicine, and in any event is better than homicidal mania. On the other hand, this laughter isn't friendly. It's cold, mocking, and supercilious. These sea dwellers are obviously laughing at you, not with you. 
You notice Karako's cheeks flushing purple under his face paint, and his jaws clenching. However, he just stares with stony dignity at the interlopers. This just makes them laugh harder. The first sea dweller says, What are you two supposed to be? Shrimp Cassidy and the Squasmos Kid? Asked the second companion. A colbait minnow and his mutated softshell crab, says the, her third. Looks like the minnow mall went down to the clown, cause it, cause causing it to splurt out another one. The sea dweller's laughter is redoubled. You continue expressionless at these insults, but you're, to your dismay, Karako's face is taking on a harsh, glowering look. You guess it must... You guess that such a tiny dude has probably been victimized by bullies his whole life. And as you know, there are no bullies like Alternian bullies. Hunk. You tell him not to let them talk all that stuff they... You... No, you, Okay. You tell him to let them talk all the stuff they want. Don't let them provoke him. They're trying to get him to do something stupid. If he doesn't react, they'll get bored and go away. Honk. No, remember that drone? It's still around here somewhere. Touch a scale on their heads and you could be rendered to the mother grub feedstock. Hey, bottom feeders, no whispering when you're in the presence of your ba of your bathers. And you, little boy, put a respectful expression on your recognition surface. Be more like your friend with the slender man the slender manatee over here. Am I Barbara Manatee? No one who in, okay, so no one who watched Veggie Tales is gonna get that reference. And only people who have watched Veggie Tales would get that reference. No one who hasn't. Well, I gave you something to look forward, to, look into. Oh gosh. Be more like your friend, the Slender Manatee over there. In fact, what is it you two are still? Why is it that you two are still poor pendicular? In the presence of sea dwellers, you should be bowed to at right anglers. The first sea dweller seems to have an affinity for cheesy ocean puns. You bow to the sea dwellers, you have your dignity, but you also like not getting killed. Oh, red eye! Red eye! He has developed the red eyes. Karako remains stubbornly upright, his face getting angrier and purpler for the moment. The bladed weapons in his belt jingle from his enraged trembling. Oh, see the little, little clownfish? He's getting angry. Looks like he's gonna wet his pants. What did I tell... What did I tell about your face, boy? Didn't your Lucis teach you anything? I doubt he even has a Lucis. A self-respecting Lucis would never let a shrimp like that out of the hive. Unless his Lucis is just as defective. Ooh, the Lucis cracks are a bit too much for Karako. Ignoring your hissed warnings, he suddenly leaps snarling into the air, draws bladed weapons from his belt in each hand, and hurtles towards the sea dwellers. Honk! Honk! I like that the I like the text. It's animated. Yeah, boy. Uh, grab him by the coattails and try to keep him from pre no, precipitating a disaster. Leap into the fray and lend comfort and support. I'm leaning into leaping into that fray. You leap into the fray to lend comfort and support. You would have counseled Karko to turn the other cheek, and to keep turning the cheek after cheek until the sea dwellers got fed up and went away. But now that things have hotted up, you're not about to let that down. Let okay, you're not about to let down the side. Karko crashes into the sea dwellers, his blade weapons whirling like a blender. You scamper close behind him and kick someone in the shin. It hurts your foot. It doesn't seem to have any other effect. These sea dwellers are made of tough stuff, or you're inc extremely flimsy. Signs have recently pointed to the latter. Your next sortie is more effective, however. Thinking quickly, you pick up a rock and throw it at the trigger root of a spring thorn growing along the path next to where the violet bloods are enduring Hurricane Clown. The coiled stalk springs out, impaling the dude with its dozen-foot-long thorns. He's thrown off balance, and violet blood begins to flow copiously down his body. That's a hue you haven't seen before. Hmm, kind of pretty. But these sea dwellers are made of tough stuff. He yanks the spring thorn stalk away from him, pulling the thorns out, and flings it into the woods. Then he takes out a pocket handkerchief and starts patting his injuries gently. Ooh, wow. Meanwhile, Karako's bladed weapons have not been idle, and the other two sea dwellers are likewise leaking violet blood. But these jerks are hard to kill. You remember Polypa telling you that. 
As you watch, one of them grabs one of the bladed weapons from Karako's hand and buries it into Karako's stomach. No! This is, unsurprisingly, is distracting for a poor little clown, allowing two of the finny sons of guns to grab handfuls of bladed weapons from his belt and bury them into various parts of his body. You dance around, delivering harmless kicks and curses. Karako is still waving his weapons, but he seems to be waving them more slowly now. Then, as more and more bladed weapons are buried in his body, he seems to lose focus. The weapons he's been brandishing fall into from his hands. Finally, he falls to the ground in the center of spreading pool of purple blood. He twitches feebly for a minute, and then is still. You stare in disbelief at the corpse of one who, if he had been spared just a short while longer, would have been your friend. One despised and rejected, a clown of suffering, familiar with pain. Oh, I get it. I get the la that works with the last name. That's great. I expect him to start going operatic. Okay. They had flogged him and mocked him and spit on him and they killed him. You struggle to come to terms with this. While you're doing that, one of the remaining sea dwellers grabs you by the hair and suplexes you into the ground. Your head snaps back and pain explodes behind your eyes. You're left lying on your back and trying to stay conscious, which is why you have a good view of what happens next. Oop, we got tossed into a ditch. Hey, a fenestrated pain. Can we keep that? The sky is dark above you. No, the dark sky above you opens. Something even darker than the sky. A hole like a cave in the clouds. <gasps> Did we just go to clown Shangri-La? It widens until you see that in the cave, a carousel with wooden horses mounted on brass posts rotates. The horses pulling up and down in time with carnival music played by a mechanical organ. Riding the horses are naked store window mannequins, their legs slung awkwardly on the horses' backs, their stiff arms down by their sides in whatever pose they're created, their horns huge and wildly shaped. In the darkness above the carousel, another naked ma other naked mannequins with plastic wings tied to their backs are supported on wires, and above these, in turn, a nut of white Christmas tree lights twinkle against the roof of the dark cave, or circus tent, or whatever this is throwing their dim starlight illumination around the rotating carousel. As you watch, two of the winged mannequins break loose from their f wires and fly down from that dark region into the night sky in the dimension Alternia occupies. They maneuver until the stiff hands of each of their stiff arms are underneath Karako, and then they lift him up into the sky into the dark carnival. You hear a last faint, reviving honk, as they set him on one of the wooden horses, and then the hole in the sky closes, and there is nothing but the night sky above you. All is silent and still again. An odd feeling comes over you. You don't think you've ever felt such a feeling. Just the reality of how utterly insignificant you are. Sure, you've spent the last few months wandering with no desire but the desire for connection, and you are, in a way, a being unique in this galaxy. But honestly, what does that even mean? You flit in and out of people's lives. There, one minute, gone the next, always moving from friend to friend. You are, for all intents and purposes, a virtual non-entity, a bland point of view vector, a neutral second-person narrator, barely coming into the picture. A retiring entity, expressing only a simple one-dimensional desire for friendship. But just about now, you're feeling things have gone pretty far. And just about now, you feel that you've had enough. Enough of arrogant high-bloods. Though, in fact, a short wavelength hemotyped carelessly. Okay. Enough, in fact, of short wavelength hemotypes carelessly and without comp compunction killing and maiming and exploiting those of lower wavelengths of a survival of the fittest of of a survival of the fittish regime that seems to come down to the survival of the most violent psychopaths. Is this a moral universe or is it not? You ask yourself. Are repulsive cruelty and sickening evil punished in this universe, or are they not? Does an ethical force operate in this universe, or does it not? You don't know the answer to these questions, but you do know one thing. You intend to depart for once from your one-dimensional persona. You intend to punish repulsive cruelty and sickening evil if it comes within your ability to do so. You intend to create an ethical force field in your local region. In you intend to exert some moral gravity right around where you are if, possi if, if possibly can. And you realize this is an odd feeling you are having seems to be a, a moral... Okay. 
Oh, <sighs> okay. And you realize that this odd feeling you're having seems to be drawing moral Higgs bosons out of the moral ground state and right out of the fabric of this multicolored blood-soaked planet that heaves under your feet. You take on an aspect of Clown Sarker. Seizing two cans of inexpensive soft drink from where they fell from Karako's bandoliers, you shake them and pull the pins. Then with malice of forethought, you redirect the twin streams at the Sea Dwellers. You smell banana and strawberry as deadly streams play upon them. Already weakened, they fall back with cries under the withering onslaught. As soon as the streams slacken, you take up two more cans, shake them, and deal out death to the unrighteous. You smell peach and diet root beer this time, but no pity softens your heart. You wouldn't care even if it were a pineapple watermelon you were spraying on these brutes. But these fin heads really ma are made of tough stuff, rallying even their... F Rallying, even in the face of this intense onslaught, they push forward and seizing some bladed weapons from the purple pool blood. Advance upon you. Not one step back, you vow for the memory of Karako Perot. You stand your ground in desperation, grabbing some cans of diet tonic water and club soda and opening your batteries once again. But to no avail. A trident pierces you to the bone, followed by a scimitar, a tomahawk, a short spear, and many other bladed weapons, with the sheer weight of them, drives you to the ground, where your red, precious blood flows in moderate streams, mixing with the purple blood of your proto-friend. This is the end, you realize, but you're glad you died in righteous battle. You're glad you created even the tiny, sputtering, temporary moral force behind your local region that you did. You can feel your life and narrative point of view slipping away, but you are content. Yet, what is that you see above you? A dark space has opened up, even darker than the night's. Guy. Man, I'm getting hiccups. Dang it. Okay. And two stiff-looking winged figures are descending. They land next to you and gently place their stiff hands under you. And they ascend once again, lifting you higher and higher into the darker space. As you pass the boundary of the heavenly carnival, your life seems to revive within you, and as the fabric of the place closes around you and the two stiff mannequins place you on the carousel horse next to Karako, you realize that planets, universes, dimensions, realities, powers, principalities, and cosmos come and go, but friendship is forever. Shh. Friendship. We hella died. What the heck? You ascended to the dark carnival, or did you? What the hell was that? What was that? Hold on. What's the other option? What do the other option do? Grab him by the coattails, try to keep him from participating in disaster. You left board and grab Karko by the coattails or by his belt. You aren't actually sure what a coattail is. Jeez, he's strong. You can barely hold him. It's like trying to restrain a small truck. His legs rotate wildly, kicking up clouds of dust, and he brandishes his bladed weapons wildly in the direction of the Sea Dwellers. After a startling moment in which they jump backwards, the Sea Dwellers have started to laugh again, coming up with the more stupid insults and fish puns. This is not helping. Karako runs twice as hard, honks twice as loud, shakes his weapons twice as threateningly. Hey, hey, you shout at Karako, trying to be heard over the fracas, holding up with all your might and digging in your heels. You have half a mind just to let him go, to pay the sea dwellers back for their insults, but you try to keep a cool head. You're doing a proto-friend much more good trying to restrain his wrath. Now you've succeeded in wrapping your arms around all the way around him, and now you get in front of him, holding him back with straight arms, bellowing smoothly into his face, trying to avoid the bladed weapons he's brandishing. But it's not working! You can see from the contorted features, the bare teeth, descended nostrils, with smoke coming out the blazing eyes, that Karako is getting more and more enraged. And suddenly, his rage seems to reach a kindling point. His body vibrates violently, his eyes glow huge and round. And suddenly from the body, something like a nuclear blast pressure wave of fear and violence sends you flying through the air like a scrap of paper in a gale. What the heck? Are you hallucinating? But you can see as you soar up from a path, the sea dwellers aren't laughing anymore. In fact, they're screaming in terror and fleeing wildly, blundering into razor leaves, being impaled by spring thorns and burned by pot acid, and generally receiving the stern retribution awaits that awaits idiots. Then your head collides in a tree branch and you're rendered unable to narrate for a while. 
When you wake up lying in the dust, if, as unconscious returns, no, as consciousness returns, you realize that you're lying on the path, and as it turns further, that a small clown painted figure is seated next to you. Quite calm now, he smiles fondly as he sees you sit up. Honk! You smile in return. You express relief that he realizes you were acting in his best interest, holding him back from the finheads. And now, through largely because of his unexpected burst of clown, clown sorcery, or whatever that was, everything has turned for, out for the best. Kariko holds up his arms for a hug, but then remembering the blighted weapons in his belt sticks out of his hand. You shake it warmly. Friendship! Woo! Okay, I had to end it on, like, a nice note. Even... <laughs> had to end it on a nice note, even though I know we got the, like, canon ending? Which is actually really depressing. Anyway... Thank you guys so much for watching this episode of Friend Sim. I will see you all next time. Bye! Hey there. Consider becoming a patron, just like the phenomenal Gerald Thomas, Bleed Red, and Alexander Madeline.